Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our fireside chat titled Framing the Landscape of Hybrid Learning in Kinder to Grade 12 Education. Our fireside chat today is powered by Classin, a world-leading solution provider for online, virtual, and hybrid face-to-face -face classrooms. My name is Yue Kun Li. I am the country manager for the Philippines and Thailand at Classin. Joining with me today, our resource speaker, Mr. Eric Lam. So thank you, Eric, for joining us today. Uh, would you like to say hi to the audience and maybe talk a little bit about your work? Sure. Thanks a lot, Yekun, for, for inviting me. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. Although we are online right now, signs of the times, we are unable to meet together, but maybe one day we can see each other again. Well, a little bit about myself. I founded and am running an educational consultancy practice doing professional development work for teachers in the areas of inquiry-based pedagogies as well as a company that produces immersive and interactive learning resources for students learning STEM, which we all know stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics. Um, on my own, I also have the privilege of co-ordering a series of science and biology textbooks for use in Singapore, as well as the Cambridge International IGCSE program. So very privileged to be here to exchange ideas with everyone. And perhaps in the course of doing so, we can learn more together. Thank you, Eric. Let's get into our topic. So our topic is about framing uh, the landscape for hybrid learning, right, in K to 12 setting. Uh, I wanted to kind of hear about your experience so far with different learning methods and pedagogies, right? Because technology has really been incorporated into classroom for a long time. Within the institutions that you have worked with, um, how do you see the teachers are making use of technology in the classroom to really make interesting, inspiring lessons for the younger learners. I just share some experiences that I have with teachers from Southeast Asia, uh, South Africa, for example, as well as the US. So I've noticed that actually quite a lot depends on the availability of hardware and software content and platforms, actually, as, as we would know. For example, one South African teacher did a blended classroom during the peak of the pandemic where she had half of the classroom logging into a synchronous platform all from home, while the other half were doing it in the classroom live, in person. So she used a rich set of interactive resources to support her pedagogy of inquiry-based learning, and it seemed to work very well. So when the school compared the year-end results of this group of students in this very blended environment with the year before that, they were actually surprised to see that even in what some people may call learning in absence, the students actually perform better, significantly oh, wow. better. But if you look at pre-pandemic period, before that, in rural schools, in Southeast Asia, for example, where schools have very little access to internet or very just simple broadband internet access, we also saw that with the right use of content and some good, developed, very well-developed platforms, the results of the students actually improved even more. So this one that I thought about in South Africa, they improved by a fair bit. Mm -hmm. But this group in the rural schools, they improved by three folds. So we're talking oh, about wow. students who used to be failing in tests. And after a good six to nine months where you have good deployment of technology in different ways compared to the South African group, the results actually improved by 300 times, uh, three times that before. And, and that really got everybody very surprised. So if you look at it, the model actually varies from school to school, country to country, but mm -hmm. technology is here to stay. It's going to change the way teaching and learning is actually going to going to take place from now onwards. The use of virtual classroom or the use of technology in the classroom might still be a bit of a new concept or something that's not very native to our educators right to some of our audiences today so can you maybe share with us your journey with you know virtual classroom applications or edtech applications in the context of k-12 learning so most of the use cases we see either involve the entire class entering a virtual classroom synchronously means so everybody participating at the same time in a live lesson facilitated by a teacher. That could be one model. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other model where a blended setting is concerned, where you have a portion of the class that are dialing in online on the platform, and the other half of the class that are actually in person in the classroom itself. At this point in time, I think it's very essential for me to point out that having a suitable platform 
to enable an experience that is virtual to be comparable with an on-site learning experience is very important. In other words, what was done on site previously must also as far as possible be done online and the platform must allow that to happen. If you have a platform that can handle all those stuff with the right pieces of technology mm -hmm. in place, that actually solves a lot of problems. I want to emphasize two points here. The first is we need also to have a powerful set of teaching content that is interactive and pedagogically designed uh, because it is critical to to make making sure that the teaching is um, the teaching endeavor is actually very effective and very efficacious, especially when you're dealing with a virtual classroom setting. The other part is a virtual classroom does not and should never devoid students from experiences of hands on manipulation during the lesson with careful planning that can be possible. I've seen many cases yes. where teachers actually run virtual classes across a virtual classroom and they could lead the students through very practical hands-on activities. So when you have these things coming together and supported by the right management tools and right management platforms, the experience can actually be very, very rich, even though everybody may be homebound at the, at the current moment. Definitely, definitely. And I wanted to really go into what can we get out of this, right? First question I want, wanted to ask you is, what are some of the current challenges in K-12 learning? that you think can be addressed by using virtual interactive classroom technology? One of the most biggest obvious challenges of K-12 schools today is during the time of the pandemic is really this on and off school closures. And you will know that teaching a live class in the classroom and trying to elicit a student's response and managing a classroom of rowdy students is a very, very big challenge. Mm -hmm. And the teacher has to be very skilled in being able to manage the classroom very, very well. However, when you go on a virtual classroom, there is a psych profoundly psychological impact on the student who is logging in. When a student logs in the virtual classroom, like you and I right now, in this kind of situation, mm -hmm. we feel that we are the only ones in the room. An individual feels that he's really going in as an individual and not as a group of people um, because of this interacting with the, with the camera. It, influence the person to watch himself or herself a little bit more. And yeah. when you have that going, actually managing a class isn't that difficult as compared to a physical classroom where students may behave in herds or in yeah. groups. And that becomes a, a, bit of a, a, a bit of an issue in that. So what we're seeing here is that in a virtual classroom environment, actually one of the key benefits, it, it actually helps in classroom management. However, this alone is not enough, right? To deliver an efficacious learning experience. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of things also that a physical classroom were not able to do effectively that a virtual classroom with the right piece of tech can actually do. For example, for example, polling. In order to do polling in, in a classroom, you can either ask everybody to raise their hands or you give everybody a personal device. The other thing is you can invest in clicker machines. All these processes either involve investment into hardware or a lack of privacy, all time taken to actually see the results. When you do this in a virtual environment, for example, something as simple as polling, the results are instantaneous, immediate, and the students feel that there's a little bit of privacy in, yeah. in that. So it actually allows the teacher to accelerate uh, or be more efficient in trying to get data, which otherwise would have taken a lot of time to get in order to move on with, with the lesson. We've talked about, you know, what kind of potential benefit that we can bring about using a virtual software in our classroom. So how do you think a virtual classroom can really add value to the existing K-12 to traditional classrooms that we have already? I think at this point, it may be interesting for me to actually share a personal experience um, that happened about in the last 18 months. So you know that in the last 18 months, the pandemic struck, I can go to many, many different places and I meet people of different races creed, culture, all coming together, sharing experiences on a common objective, which is how to make our children learn. This was great because they allow us to learn from one another without boundaries right now. Now imagine the same environment, but in a classroom where students are learning together from people of different uh, uh, cultures, from diff people of different background, but learning the same thing together. Is this, is this possible? 
Yes, it is. Have we done it before? Yes, we did. So for example, in Singapore, early this year, we worked with uh, an elementary school in, in Singapore where they collaborated with another school in Xiamen, China. And these, two were, these schools were collaborating live together on a singular platform together. They were doing it live. And in between them, there is a tour guide that was actually uh, facilitating or bringing them on a virtual tour that is in a National History Museum in, in Xiamen and then asking them to look at some of the inventions, some of the gifts to the Chinese emperors during that time. And both group of students from different parts of the world were learning together, exploring the concept of STEM and STEAM and all the different concepts during curriculum time with students, as you can see in the picture over here, with students actually presenting and sharing with one another across the oceans. So when you look at that kind of environment, you suddenly realize that with the right technology clinging everybody up together, mm. the world becomes very small. One of the key things I want to stress about the power of a virtual classroom is not everybody can afford to travel halfway across the world to learn about the culture on the other side, to get to know how people behave, how people learn the same thing as we do. But with a virtual classroom, all these things is possible. Now that said, in order for this to happen, we've got to take care of some structural considerations. For example, you're going to have a stable internet connection. I think internet connection and even having a device that allows us to, to actually access the internet is no longer a luxury. Hmm. It is a must now. The second thing which I consider as actually of paramount importance, you need to have a platform that can facilitate this whole process hmm. seamlessly. And the third thing is, in a teacher toolbox, you got to have solid content that allows teachers to teach even though students are learning from different places. So why don't we go a bit more into the specifics about, you know, how do we actually make use of the virtual classroom? So can you maybe give us some examples of subjects or even pedagogical approaches or learning scenarios that you think is very successful in your own teaching or the teaching of people that you know? I advocate the practice of inquiry-based learning in uh, any teaching practice because essentially it captures a lot of other pedagogies or strategies such as problem-based learning and so on as we know it to be. In order for this to happen, you got to have this teaching model. For example, we, we advocate the use of the 5E instructional model which broadly comprises five stages. You start by engaging the student, then you let the students have the opportunity to explore the concept and during this process you don't really tell them the right answer, you just let them explore and let them talk about it. And then after that, you teach them the right answer and teach them how to use the right terms to explain what is going on. Then the fourth E is elaborate, which you tried as a teacher, we try to give them opportunities to apply what they have just learned. Finally, to evaluate their understanding. So these five E's occurs in this kind of succession. Huh? Now, if you look at these five E's, this is where engagement comes in the most important. Because when a student is engaged, they would like to be involved in the, in the learning process. So what we found most powerful in engaging students is having on hand a very rich repertoire of content resources that they can use to actually engage students. Now here, I want to share just a very quick concrete example of what that actually means. For example, when we work with teachers, uh, let's use the example of science. Let's use the example of the topic of electricity, something very abstract. When we were talking to, to, to teachers on how to actually teach something like that, we were saying that as an engaged activity, what should we give to students? So, so teachers were like, looking at it and they said, look, uh, maybe we give them a battery and then we, we ask them to look at it and tell us what can a battery do. And, and that got me curious because I asked them, I said, why would you want to do something like that? Because a battery is a very common thing, right? I mean, you see it all the time. And the teachers were telling me, is it precisely because they see it all the time, it is real. Now, their yeah. assumption is when something is real, it is always engaging because it's real. I get to see it. So we said, we, let's test it on the students. So they got a group of students to come together and they give them everyone this battery and they ask them to think about what is going on. Now, as it turned out, students, as we know, all already know what a battery looks like and what a battery can do because many of them were teenagers. So when you ask them to do this, they actually felt a little bit insulted. Oh. And when they felt a little bit insulted and the teacher tried to ask them questions again to answer them and so on, what you get back is a one word answer or one sentence answer mm -hmm. and that's it. There's nothing else. So that kind of experience became very awkward, typically became very dull in, in, in that. So we said, all right, let's, let's try it for, for, for another class and use a different strategy, but the class has similar ability and behavioral prof profile, right? 
So we give the teacher this particular video and we said, why not show this right at the beginning and see the response? So let me just show you what, what, what that is. And this is the video that I wanted to, I wanted the teacher to show. So as you can see over here, um, what I do is that I start off by, uh, I'm just going to turn off the sound here. So I start off by showing them an alarm and clock that is working. And then after that, I, we, the teacher started to ask the student, what do you think is powering an alarm clock? And then as the camera pans, you begin to see that, oh, there's a lemon that's, that's powering it. And look at how we are shooting it. As it pans forward, there's another lemon. And then as it pans even further, are there any more lemons? Yes, there is a third one. But is that all it takes, right? So as you look at this video further and you can see how many lemons are there, at this point in time, the students were grasping. They were looking at it, oh. okay, um, am I seeing something real here or, or, or not? And just in case the children were thinking that we were cheating them, we were bluffing and so on, hmm. watch how the camera was panning all the way back to the, to the clock. And what we did was that we flipped the clock around just to show them that there are no batteries at the back. It's just the lemons, they're powering an alarm clock that was ringing. So we showed them this to show them that there's no magic trick, there's no cheating, this is all there is. And we asked the teacher to ask the students, so what is going on? The moment they showed this video, we, we watched and we were studying the behavior of students. The moment we showed this video, all the questions were coming in fast and furious. Now the question then we need to ask ourselves, can we do this in a virtual environment? Of course we can. It is an interactive digital piece of content. I can share it on screen. I can let my students look at it. And then I can give out simulations on screen and I can assign it to a student who can work on it while the rest of the student watch it. I can give a timer to it to let students play a little game when I'm, when I can do all these things in a virtual setting with a few click of a button as compared to the kind of resources I need to prepare in the actual classroom and trying to manage the response around it. If you have a platform that's able to host all this con uh, conveniently and you have a set of content that they are pedagogically designed well to promote inquiry, for example, or to promote enduring understanding in, in develop enduring understanding in students, then what you see is happening is a very concrete example of what world-class pedagogies can now happen in a virtual environment by a teacher who may not necessarily be very skilled at teaching. You can be dealing with a teacher who may not be that gifted in communicating, but when you give them the right tools, you give them the right platform, you give them the right content, the whole teaching and learning experience just becomes very, very different. I, I wanted to talk a bit more about the actual implementation, right? Because uh, we understand the significance, we understand the value of virtual classroom in K-12. Um, let's talk more about the pra practical side of things and about real life implementation. So number one, like to teach on a virtual platform, some educators have ex expressed their worries about you know, regulating and monitoring students' attention. In what ways do you think an effective online learning platform can really help address this issue? We are following what I was just sharing just now. Like, like what you said, uh, um, you have, we realized that a successful online lesson, actually mm. one of the key things is the engagement part, the hook. They want to hook students in. Hmm. So to engage the students, you need to give teachers certain tools, especially for a virtual environment, uh, to allow that to happen. And the tool has actually two very important dimensions. The first dimension is content. Actually, because in the, the profession of teaching is the use of content for students to develop content and process knowledge. That is, that is what learning is, right? So when we talk about content is about showing content that is relevant to the learners. Now, this is interesting. What is relevant to us as adults are often not relevant to a child or a teenager. And it takes quite a fair bit of skill and reflection to get to what really makes the younger audience tick. And here, maybe I just share a little, a little graphic to just illustrate what I mean when I talk about the different handles of, of relevance, right? They must be able to do one or more of these five things. The first thing is to be able to share it. What is relevant to you and I, you want to share it. When we share something, we have social currency, which is something that is not tangible, but it builds your reputation, right? The second thing is when we deal with relevant stuff, we typically like to play with it. 
So there are a bit of game mechanics involved in it. The third is we need to feel a sense of autonomy or freedom. Of course, the last two are almost together. You've got to give them a sense of awe, a sense of joy when they look at, when they learn something, or they, it must be something that will pique their interest uh, uh, through something that really surprises them. So that's really what, what relevance is all about. And when you have content that deals with these things, or you have a platform that allows you to allow kind of play mechanics that goes on during the lesson itself, relevance is promoted. When relevance is promoted, students are engaged. When students are engaged, they will ask questions, they will explore, they will learn. And this is where the problem with class management will slowly begin to dissolve. The second thing which is related to content is interaction tools. You got to have interaction tools that allow the students to communicate to the student, uh, to the teacher or the teacher to communicate to the students. So for example, some of the other tools to actually engage the, the students in the learning process could be something as simple as a timer. I start a timer and then I ask this set of questions. I ask students to bid for it. And then those who bid for it, I give a score and I give a, I give a trophy, I give something. So you gamify this experience like I talked about just now, a bit of game mechanics hmm. involved in it. I do a poll so that students feel participated in that process enough. They feel that there's a little bit of autonomy, a bit of freedom, a bit of control in what they, in what they want to learn. When you combine the two together with solid pedagogies, which I spoke about just now, for example, the 5E model and, and so on, and very clear instructional models, the whole experience can be very rich and it can be very, very phenomenal. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I suppose in the same vein, educators may also find the transitioning to online or to virtual or teaching quite a bumpy ride as they might have already encountered one or technical requirement and learning to really just focus so much on mastering the software. So how can virtual classroom platforms really help our educators to make a smooth transition? So is another teacher in South Africa, uh, whom we know already for some time. Now, the interesting thing about it is prior to the pandemic, the only edutech piece of technology that she used to use was Gmail. She said that to us. She right. said, you know what? All I know how to use is Gmail. And not even Google Classroom, not even Google Drive and so on. So when the pandemic struck and schools were closed, she was desperate to ensure that lessons could continue with the same level of learning experience as before, like everything happening in the classroom, right? So she, we, we developed science content. So to use some of our interactive science content to teach a 14 year old in the school. And so what we did was that we gave her a simple platform for her to deal with and walking her through to do that. And when school progressively reopened, she, like many of her friends uh, or colleagues, she started to move half of the class back into the classroom. The other half was still logging online and so on. In such a short period of time, mm. she could so quickly get onto a simple piece of technology mm. and get things going. So I guess my point here is this, if you have a system, there's design for the educator. It should be fairly easy to learn and educators should not be afraid or worried too much about the onboarding process. And, and going yeah. beyond teachers, going beyond the schools, I think another key stakeholder in the K-12 education process is obviously the parent. So many of them are quite hesitant to allow their children with more screen time. So this problem is another hurdle faced by many online education platform, which is again, how to ensure parents that they have made the quote unquote right decision or perhaps even the best decision to bring their kids to an online or virtual classroom. I like to use the word meaningful to go along with the concept of play and screen time. Now, because these are two aspects of a children's life that work like double aged swords. If you use them right, the child will blossom. If you use them wrong, the child deteriorates. The key here is to know the difference of these two dimensions that are separated by a very thin line. And it is in this thing called meaning. So when play is meaningful, for example, it is productive. And play can take many dimensions. So let's just use the most polarized one that everybody talks about. Playing computer games or online games. It is play, it is screen time, right? So when such play is meaningful, the child develops self-confidence knowledge, skills. In other words, he learns as he plays. However, if it is not meaningful, a whole lot of problems will occur. Addiction and a whole lot of behavioral problems, a lot of issues and everything will, will come up. Now let's take screen time. When screen time is meaningful, a child develops knowledge, a child learns something, and in some aspects actually gets a mental break. Physiologically, both activities of playing and watching a screen 
can cause all sorts of harms to a body if done excessively. We all know that. Even if they are meaningful, mm. if done excessively, they will cause the harm. Yeah. Yet, when done in moderation, this can also be powerful for the child as we go along. So my take is this. Assuming that parents manage to ensure a moderated approach for their children to assess screen time as they do with play, then the next thing to consider is meaningful screen time permitted for their children. So when you talk about online learning experience, now teacher who can use systems to actually engage and interact with the students, they actually tend to deliver a much richer experience and much more engaging to the learner. Now combine that with solid learning content or teaching content a teacher can use, then the screen time spent online with a teacher should actually be encouraged. Yeah, totally agree. This is the last question I would like to discuss with you about, you know, the future, uh, about your vision on EdTech. So in the future, what do you think would be the ideal teaching scenario? I would say that you will fall into two major, um, very simple, very easy to describe item, but can be pretty abstract. The mm -hmm. first one is, the whole world within my room. That is, that is the first vision. I can access the whole world of learners everywhere. I can talk to friends. I can learn everywhere. Not your Coursera way, where I learn as an individual talking to somebody, but I want to learn with a group of people. I want to be right. able to share with them, even though I, can, I don't get to meet them in person. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to make exchanges with them, learn about them as they learn about me. So, so that is one of the things that I think uh, in a virtual, virtual environment, this is going to be one of those great visions that can happen. And the pandemic basically accelerated this whole thing, um, uh, making, it, making it all very, very, very possible. Mm. That's one thing. The second thing is what I would like to call a blood test for my knowledge. Why blood tests? We all know that in the medical field, whenever we want to test how, how we are, our body is going on, all we need to do is to draw a valve of blood from our system and it goes through a whole biochemistry test and it comes out with a report to tell you whether you have high cholesterol, high whatever, that, that, right. that you go along with it. Hmm. Now imagine right. that happening on an ed tech, edu tech setting, where even though I'm not present physically in the classroom because of the school closures, because of a whole lot of things that's happening, I can actually take this kind of test that analytically, granularly breaks it down to the point that my teacher know exactly what I do not know. Some people call that AI. Some people call that machine learning. But effectively, it granularly analyzes the gaps of the student's learning. And that's what we, we were working on for some time, for, for science that allows us to granularly break that down so that an educator knows exactly what to intervene, to who, for what topic, in what way. When you have that kind of granular spread, which is actually happening in healthcare right now, if you do that in education, and this can only be done with edutech when you, when you do that, mm. you combine that with a global classroom within your room, in your screen, where you can mix with everybody together, the whole experience takes on a whole new dimension altogether. No longer are we limited by the need to be able to travel and spend nine months in a given place that is, that is new to us and, and forget about everything that's back home because now I can get as rich an experience. And my learning efficiency is now a lot faster because my my mentor, my facilitator knows exactly what I do not know even before I know them and they know what to do to help me along. Personalized learning done on a global scale in a community well facilitated by a platform that strings everybody together so that we all have fun and enjoy the learning process as we are learning something together. That's my vision. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. And with that, we will conclude our fireside chat today. Again, thank you so very, very much to Eric for sharing your experience and your knowledge with us. We hope to hear more from you in the future. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. We hope this session has been able to offer you some new ideas. And uh, if you wish to learn more about Classin, please feel free to visit our virtual booth at EduTech Asia Conference Hall. Leave a message and have a chat with one of our colleagues to learn more about our interactive online and hybrid classroom solutions. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is our fireside chat today. Thank you so much and bye-bye.